good morning. I just want to uh, begin by reiterating what Nathan said about our VBS this week, thanking all of you for uh, your efforts and uh, everything that come from the, uh, from food to teaching to helping uh, get kids here and, and, uh, and all these things that it takes to make that week successful. And uh, although we were a little concerned about the weather uh, Friday, we were blessed, uh, kind of went to our east, and, and so that's a good thing. And, and unless you live in the east, <laughs> and then uh, God loves those people too. But anyway, uh, Wednesday night we're going to have a little celebration for the kids that we were planning on doing on Friday. So uh, try to bring those kiddos back and, and uh, just come and be with us. And we're going to have games out back and, and we're going to have food and we're going to do, uh, they're going to get to put the shaving cream on Pastor Tim. Uh, so uh, we're all looking forward to seeing that happen. And so uh, just have to be careful because uh, you, you can get sucked in. Uh, so, but anyway, uh, come and, and uh, enjoy that Wednesday night. Bring those kids and thank you, thank you, thank you again. Uh, for a successful uh, VBS. A lot of seeds were planted this week. A lot of questions were asked by kids about Christ, and, and so that's what we do. And, and so you plant those seeds, and then we'll begin to continue uh, to harvest. So uh, we're certainly looking forward to that. This morning, we conclude our series on Moses, and this has been our summer series and our character study and, and, and just absorbing what God has for us uh, from this. And this morning, lessons learned from Moses resistance because uh, really this whole series on Moses just brings us to the beginning of the Exodus. Uh, it's all about his preparation and, and the call on his life and how God used that, how he molded that. And, and you might think, wow, you're just kind of getting to the beginning of the Moses story and you're ending the series. Well, listen, Moses lived to be 120 years old. This was the first 80 years. <laughs> okay, This was two-thirds of his life uh, was at the burning bush. And, and so you think about God's timing and God's preparation to bring him to this place. And, and, and so we just spent five weeks uh, looking at what God did over 80 years in preparing a man uh, for a calling. And so I hope we've all been able to learn a little bit about uh, what God does when he calls our hearts. And, 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 and this is, uh, we left uh, Moses last week kind of barefooted and hanging uh, with his mouth hanging open, standing in front of a bush that was on fire but not burning up. And, and, and so I want to go back to that passage of Scripture. I want to go back to where we left him last week and, and remind you and remind myself of the direct command, the direct call that God gave to Moses in that moment because it was very clear. There was really not a whole lot of uh, uh, under, misunderstanding in that. Uh, and uh, so to speak, uh, God really didn't beat around the bush. Okay, uh, So Exodus 3.10 uh, gives us that directive that he uh, told him. He said, Go. Uh, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So there was no question about where he was going. There was no question about what he was to do. Uh, it was very clear. And Moses understood this call because he had a passion for it. Think about that for just a moment. God calls you. When he calls you, he always calls you to something that you're passionate about. Okay? There's always something in your heart. Uh, there's always something that's already there. And, and so Moses already had this desire. He just went out about it the whole wrong way. Now, you guys are parenting. Uh, a lot of you all parent or grandparent. And, and, and so uh, as the new shirt that's out says, I saw this administrator had this on. Said it's, His shirt said, parent. It's a verb. Uh, we do things as parents, and we, we, we make these decisions for our kids. And sometimes when our kids make mistakes, the way that we deal with that mistake is we let them live with it. Okay, we let them live with it for a little while anyway. Now with kids, you know, it's kind of a short-term thing, and sometimes it's like, no, you made a mistake, so you're going to have to deal with that. And and, and so when we, we do that, we let them learn from their mistakes. Now, I'll just remind you, in, in God's parenting of his son Moses, it was 40 years. All right? I mean, his mistake was pretty bold, and it was pretty big, and he took matters into his own hands. He killed another man. He killed an Egyptian. Even though that person was oppressing the Israelite people, Moses was doing God's will his way. He took matters into his own hands, killed an Egyptian. So now we are coming to the end of 40 years of you just think about that. Okay? Can you imagine that? Just the, you, you just sit around and you think about your, your mistake for 40 years. And so Moses has done this this long. And so now here he is, 40 years of silence from God, 40 years to think about what he had done and the mess that he had made of things in Egypt. His life at this point had been one great big self-effort. And what we, where we pick up the story today is, is an understanding that stubbornness is very hard to overcome. 
All right. Stubbornness is very hard to overcome. Yesterday morning, I was ready to take a couple of heifers to Bowling Green so Michaela could show them. We had taken after the storms passed on Friday, uh, or in the middle of such, we, we took a couple of the sheep and took some animals to Bowling Green, and Taylor and Sandy stayed there with Taylor. And, and, uh, and so I was going to bring the heifers on, on uh, Saturday morning. So I got up early, about 5.30 yesterday morning. And I went to the barn, and there's my girls. And, and so I pour the feed out, and they start eating. And I put a halter on one and start to take her uh, to where we wash them and get them ready for show. And she was having to leave her buddy, okay? She was having to leave the girl. And it's like, oh, no, I'm not going to walk, okay? And I'm like, come on, your halter broke. You've done this. We've been through this. We've been, you know, in places and up and down in, in Louisville, for crying out loud, in concrete floors and in parking lots with horns and cars. And this is, we're on the farm, and you won't. And she's like, oh, no. And so, and I'm dragging, and she's balking. And so it's one of those things that you know, everything that you got, and then she takes a step. And so we did this for about a half an hour. Stubbornness is very hard to overcome. But you have to understand, I won. Okay, now I lost some blood vessels in my fingers and I couldn't feel a couple of them the rest of the day, but I won. And if that hadn't worked, I would have got the tractor and we would have really won, okay, because I was going to win. And that's what, what happens to us when God is just trying to give us, uh, He will overcome our stuff. And He, Psalm 32 9, this is what He reminds us of. Uh, Psalm 32 9, He says, Don't be like the horse or the mule, they don't have any understanding and they have to be controlled by a bit by bridle, by halter, or tractor. Okay, don't be like that. Don't be like that, all right? Mule-headedness, all right? This is where Moses is beginning to show his mule-headedness because this is his response. God gave him a direct call. It was a direct command. It was a directive that, that he understood because it was already in his heart. It was what he was supposed to do. But watch his Response, Exodus chapter 3, verse 11, Moses says to God, Well, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Now, at first glance, you might read over this and go, Well, what a humble guy, okay? What a humble guy. Who am I to go do this, okay? Who am I to go do this? And, and, and what we have to remember that is, is that when God calls you, don't second-guess your team, Okay? You know, don't, because Moses is beginning resistance here. And so it, we might see it as humbleness, but he's beginning to say, mm -mm, no, I'm not going to do that. Okay. That is not for me. I, I heard you. <laughs> okay. I heard you. But, and I've, 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 I used to be there, but right now I'm not there. Okay. I've been doing this sheep thing for 40 years, not planning on changing anytime soon. And I don't understand why you would do this, but here I am. When God calls you, never second guess the team that is around you because it's all you need. I like to watch NASCAR from time to time, and I, and I, and I notice different things about different tracks. And some tracks, we call them driver's tracks because like Bristol and, and, uh, and short tracks, it's all about the handling of the car. It's all about the driver decision. It's all about kind of manhandling the car around the track and, and doing those kinds of things. And there's other, other tracks like the super speedways, Talladega and, and Daytona, that so many times, especially after qualifying, if the driver's uh, pretty clear about what he's got going on, he'll, he'll stand behind the, the microphone and say, you know, it really have anything to do with me. I just kind of got out there and just drove it around like anybody could, and, and my team and the people who prepared the car, they did this. They asked Bobby Allison one time, they said, what's the scariest thing you've ever seen in a race car? Bobby thought for a minute, he said, backstretch, Talladega, side by side with Starling Marlin, going about 210 miles an hour. I look out of the corner of my eye. Sterling's eating a corn dog and drinking an RC and driving with his knee. Scariest thing I've ever seen in a race car. All right, Talladega. And you can get away with it because, because the car does the work and everything just kind of rolls around. And, and the thing about it is, is that God was about to deliver the people from Egypt. God was about to do this. And all he needed was Moses to ride along. All right? All he needed was Moses to ride along. And so the mistake that Moses makes, and this is a mistake that we make, I need you to do this. Well, who am I to do that? I can't do that. I don't need you to do that. I just need you to ride along. Have an RC and a corn dog and watch what I'm going to do. Okay? Watch what's about to happen, Moses. It's not about you. And it's not about your power or your 
ability. See, it's not about your power and your ability, but it's about my power and my ability. Never underestimates, never underestimate God's power. And certainly, certainly never try to replace it with your own. Never try to replace it with your own. Exodus 3.12, Moses, God is very clear to Moses about what he, what he has to say in, in, in verse 12. God promises and says, and it, it's all right there in the first, in those, in those simple words. I will be with you. I will be with you. You see, when God calls you to something, he never calls you, sends you, and says, see ya. Okay? He calls you, he sends you, and he goes with you. When he, said, when he told Moses, I need you to go get the people, it's not like, and I'll be here burning in this bush and come back by and see me. Okay? I'm going to be with you, Moses. You don't understand. They, they, I'm too much for them to handle, so I'm going to work through you. And you're going, to be, well, you're going to be my vessel. You're going to be my instrument. You're going to be the car in this. But you have no idea what I'm going to do. And I will be with you through it all. God promises Mo Moses all of him. <laughs> this has been a really good time for a power verse for Moses, wouldn't it? It's been a really good time to put that Philippians 4.13 on the dashboard of the race car, wouldn't it? I can do all things through him who gives me strength, okay? It hadn't been written yet, had it, okay? No, this is Old Testament. This is all the way back. This is the beginning. These are the foundations of our faith. This is those moments when God is just trying to have a relationship with his people and going, come on, Moses, come on. I need you to do this. Oh, but I can't. I don't know. Who, who am I? I don't have to have you, Moses. <laughs> I've just chosen you. I've just chosen you. So Moses resists. And, and, and so let's look at his resistant statements. Let's look at the things that he says, and, then, and let's look at God's response. His, his first excuse comes in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 13. He says, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, well, what's his name? So he's talking about the, he's not even getting to the Egyptians here. I'm just going to the, to the Israelites himself, the people that are leading the, the people that are oppressed. And I ask them, and they say, well, who, what, what am I, you, okay, you see? <laughs> Look at what God says. Why do we... Why do we always feel like we have to have all the answers? Okay? Why do we always do that? You see? It's a pride thing is what it is. And, and here's God's response. I am who I am. If you pull this out in the Hebrew and take the, 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 uh, the vowels out, it, it, it's Yahweh. Okay? This is where we get Yahweh. I am. I am. Tell him I am is who sent you. Look, Moses, you will have all of me. You will have all of me. And, and notice in this, there's two things in this statement, in God's statement to him, that, that he gives to Moses of assurance. Okay, chapter 3, verse 18. Let's look at verse 18. And, and he says, The elders of Israel will listen to you. All right? Moses says, Well, what if they don't listen to me? What if they don't? <clears throat> Excuse me, Moses. The elders of Israel will listen to you. It's an assurance. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, no bones about it, okay? The elders will listen to you. And then verse 20. I will stretch out my hand. I will strike the Egyptians with the wonders that I will perform among them. It'll blow your mind, Moses. And after that, he will let you go. Spoiler alert, <laughs> okay? Spoiler alert, Moses, here's the end of the story. They will listen to you, and he will let you go. It's going to happen, all right? There, you, don't have to, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to second guess. I just need you to go carry out the plan. I need you to go carry out the plan. And resistance is futile on Pharaoh's part, okay? I'll get the tractor, and he's going to walk, okay? That's just the way it's going to end. He will let you go mark it down. And you guys know the end of the story, right? He did. He got his attention. It was pretty rough. It was pretty rough. He got his undivided attention. It was a done deal. And so, you know, 
Wouldn't you like to think that if this were you, I mean, come on. Wouldn't you like to think that if this were you, having a conversation with God in a burning bush, that you would just kick off the sandals and go, whatever, man. <laughs> whatever, God, that you would just hit your face and say, yep, whatever you say, I'll do. Wherever you lead, I'll go. Okay, Steve used to write that down. It'd be a great song. Okay, whatever, okay, whatever you want, I'll do it. Wouldn't you think that you would like to be that? And then, and you're thinking, how could this conversation even take place? Because Moses goes on. What if they don't believe me or listen to me? And the Lord did not appear to you. What if they say that? <laughs> this reaction shows us just how deeply Moses fears ridicule. All right? And I think deep down we all do, don't we? And, and, and this, we fear what others will think. We fear what others will say. And so God's, God's assurances just kind of went whoop right over his head. Okay? They will listen to you. He will let you go. Promise. Whew, just flies right over, doesn't it? Well, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to me? What if they say you didn't, that this didn't happen, that this conversation didn't even happen? And God's like, oh, wow. You see, Moses is still in mule mode. He's still in stubborn mode. He's still in that place, and his excuse is hypothetical. Beware of the what if, okay? Beware of the what if. You wonder what God was thinking, because his excuse was hypothetical. What if? You, you, you see him in this stubborn mode, and Moses is denying a clear promise of God. He's denying a clear promise. Beware of the what if monster. Okay? particularly when it comes to the call of God on your life. Beware of the what-if monster. When you know that he's, when you know, when, you, when it's clear to you that this is what you're supposed to do, when you know that what God's calling you, and you go, well, what if they don't want to, you know, what if they don't listen, or what if they don't come, or what if they don't, you know, respond, or what if I show up and nobody's there, and, and what if, and beware of the what-if monster, Okay? Because those hypotheticals will run you crazy. And when God has been clear in his call, and, and, and God, he'll take care of it. Because he's with us. God is so patient with Moses. But yet so powerful. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 2. Look at what God says to him. What's that in your hand? Uh... A staff. So verse 3. God says, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground. And it became a snake. And this is where I know that Moses is a smart man. Because he ran from it. Okay? He ran from it like any smart man would do. And this is where I question him. The Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. I'm reminded of a story that Wendy Bagwell told once on a gospel album. It was about an old snake handling church, and he was tore up about these guys handling these snakes. And one of the ladies in the church asked him, they said, you mean to tell me if the Lord commanded you to take up the serpent, you wouldn't take him up? And he said, yes, ma'am, I surely would. But he didn't, and I ain't. God commanded Moses to reach out and take hold of the snake. Now, this is where his faith begins to grow. He did, and it turned back into a stick. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, and the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Watch this, Moses, verse 6. Put your hand inside your cloak. Moses put his hand inside his cloak. When he took it out, it was leprous. Now listen, that's the greatest fear of people of this time there's no cure and you had to be separated okay from your family and it eats you alive and so God gave Moses leprosy standing right there in front of a burning bush in the middle of nowhere he gives him leprosy and Moses is looking at this in his hand going 
Oh, my gosh. And then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, the skin was leprous. It became as white as snow. And then verse 7, he puts it back in and takes it back out, <laughs> and it's healed. I want you to know something. God had given Moses power that no man had received to this point. Okay? He had been given, it was restored. And, 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 and so God had now given Moses power that had never been given to man before. That's how patient he was with him. He was like, look, if you don't think that, if you're going to be what if, if you're going to be hypothetical, then this is what I'm going to give you. This, what is that in your hand, Moses? It's a staff. It may be just an ordinary staff, but when I touch it, it becomes power. Whatever you have, Moses, whatever you bring to the table, whatever you come with, becomes very powerful when I'm with you. So Moses is surely convinced now, right? Got the marching orders, we're ready to go, let's get on the road. No, no. Another excuse. Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. Look what he has to say. Pardon your servant, uh, Mel Tillis. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. I can't talk very good in front of people. God, I'm a fear, I have a fear of public speaking. Last year we studied Paul. Uh, looking at 1 Corinthians in chapter 2 and verse 1, uh, Paul talks about the same thing. He says, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. Paul never got over, okay? He never got over what God did for him. He was a Christian killer, okay? Had committed murder, kind of like our boy Moses. And he never got over what God did for him. And it was not through any eloquence. It was not through any masterful public speaking display. It was through a humble, he died for us. Okay? Some of the most powerful things that you hear are people's personal testimonies when they share what God has done and how he has changed their lives. And Paul may have not been eloquent in speech, but man, when he wrote a letter to a church, it was as if God's own hand had written it. We still have them, don't we? We still have them. God used him. God used him. Exodus chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. God becomes this encouraging parent. Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? In verse 12, he says, Now go, I'll help you speak. I'll teach you what to say. Just get out there, man. Come on, get out there. Here's your glove. Here's your bat. Go on. Just go. Just go. I'll be, I'll be with you. I'll be right over here. Okay, whatever you need, I got you. He, he becomes that encouraging uh, one that just kind of pushes us along. <laughs> so you think that's enough, right? I mean, once you get them all going, it's like you're going in the right direction, you know? I picked up one of the little kids. He was a three-year-old for Bible school <laughs> this week. <laughs> and it just reminded me of this, a little Rowan. He, we, he opened the door the first night we went. His sister comes out and jumps in the van. And then here comes Rowan. He comes off the steps. He's like, <sighs> and then all of a sudden, I've never seen such a facial expression change. He just melts. He's like, I can't do it. <laughs> and he just falls to the ground. He just mumps, just pu He's just in a puddle of tears. And I'm like, oh, no, it's okay. And so we pick him up and take him back in the house. He kicks his sandals off. He's like, I can't do it. And he's like, well, tomorrow. We'll, we'll try again. And so the next night he's like, I'm going now. And so he comes out in his little Batman shirt and he jumps in the van. And he makes it. Okay? And you would think that the guy's looking at Moses going, Come on, man. Come on. You can do this. You can do this. You got this. Excuse number four Exodus 4 13. <laughs> Pardon your servant, Lord. Can you send somebody else? Can you just send some anybody but me? Anybody but me. Send someone else. And here's the thing. God accommodates Moses' desire. Okay? In verse 14, he says, fine. He gets mad. He says, what about your brother? 
He can speak well. We'll let, you, we'll let him go with you. And, and here's the thing. Here's the lesson that we take from this. The compromise was less than the best. Okay? Moses continued, and this is, this is you got to understand, this exchange that we're studying here, these, these passages of Scripture that we're looking, is a beautiful example of, of God's call, but the free will of man. Okay? Moses had free will all the way through this. I mean, the power of God burning in a bush right there, talking, speaking to him, calling him. Take off your shoes, boy. You're on holy ground all of this moment. But yet the free will of man, Moses is resisting, going, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. And God is working with him and going, okay, 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 okay. Take Aaron with you. But we, we learn from this that compromise is less than the best, Okay. Because fast forward a few years, and Moses is on the mountain receiving God's law, and Aaron's down there, he's cooking up some, some stuff, isn't he? Making a golden calf, and everybody's having a big party. You see, compromise is less than the best. We're better off to just say, okay, God, whatever you say, I'll do it. And I, and I know that you're going to be with me, and I can trust you. And so the question of this series and the question for us as we study this and as we look at this and as we begin to land this thing is, what is God nudging you to do? What is God nudging you to do? Because most likely you didn't walk out back of your house sometime this week and, and find a bush on fire, okay? And, and a voice speaking to you from it. If you did, we need to talk, okay? Because that's a big deal. But, but when you begin to read, okay, when you begin to study... When you begin to pray, guarantee you of one thing. God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for you, and he'll begin to call you, and it'll come through gentle nudging. He'll begin to say, this is what I have prepared you for. This is what I have called you to do, and I would like for you to do this. And you'll begin to see something. Like Moses saw those oppressed Israelites, you'll begin to see a class that needs a teacher. You'll begin to see a ministry that needs, that needs a leader. You'll, you'll begin to see something that begins to burn inside your heart, and all of a sudden it'll be like, I kind of think maybe, possibly, I don't know, I would really rather him get somebody else, but I see a need that's unmet, and, and, and it's bothering me, okay? It's bothering me, because when, when you come to me, or you come to one of our pastors, or you come and say, you know, I'm noticing this, or I'm seeing this, or I'm thinking about this, here's a, here's a, here's a little thing for you. Not everybody is, okay? Not everybody noticed it. You did, because God is nudging you. So my question is, what is he nudging you to do? You don't have all the whys, and you don't have all the answers, but there's three things I want you to remember as we, as we end this and as we come to this place and as you begin to explore God's call on your life. The first is this. Be certain it's God's voice, okay? Okay? Be certain it is God's voice. Because before you undertake a major life decision or a, or a major life direction change, be careful that it is God's voice that you're hearing. Okay? Because here's the thing. There are people who also read and study His Word. And, and you should be friends with them. And, and there are people who, who, who pray. And there are people who know you. And there are people who love you. And there are people that God has spoken into that are looking out for your best interest. And so when you begin to explore a direction in life, when you begin to explore something that you feel like God's asking you to do, those people that he has put in your life, they should encourage it. They should encourage that. When I begin to feel like, I, I was like, I think God's calling me to preach. I, I don't really understand what this means. I don't, I don't know what this looks like. But when I went to all these guys that were, that were my friends and that had prayed for me and worked with me and taught me, and I began to ask them, when I sat in Brother Armstrong's office and said, how do you know when you're being called to preach? And he looked at me and said, the fact that you're sitting in my office asking me the question because no one else is lined up at the door. You're unique. It's a call on your life. And so when you, when you go to those folks and when you, when you do those, God will begin to reaffirm. Because when you kind of get something in your own mind and you think, I want to do this and I'm just going to go tell everybody that God has called me to do this, be careful. And listen, if you go to them and say, God's called me to do this, they go, I don't know about that. That could be really, really devastating. That could really hurt, you know, what's going on. Then you need to take two steps back and go, wait, is this God's voice? Is this God's voice? Number two, 
Be confident in his power. Okay? Be confident in his power. We make this mistake all the time. When we feel like God's called us to do something, when we feel like God has, has asked us to do something, he will equip you. Okay? That was another one of those things that I was struggling with, you know, all of the things and the knowledge and, you know, what I needed to study and learn. And, and, and Glenn told me. Uh, he put his arm around me and he said, God equips who he calls. Just go. Okay? Just go. And so Moses didn't really understand the whole, you know, staff into a snake thing and how this was all going to play out. But God's like, look, you got power. You just go use it. And trust, I'll be with you always. Be confident in his power. And finally, be comfortable with his plan. Be comfortable with his plan. Take it the way he gives it to you. It may involve some meandering. It may involve a road that is harder than you might really want to travel. But be comfortable with his plan. Back in the 70s, we were at Mammoth Cave. I was a kid, little kid. We were at Mammoth Cave for a Coleman or a Felty reunion, one of that side of the family. And, and so we'd had a picnic, and after we had our picnic lunch and everything, we all went out for a hike. And a lot of you guys have been there, and so you know the trails that go around the caves. And, and so we had been hiking for a while, and, and we were all getting kind of tired, and it was July, and it was hot, and we were coming back. And, and as we were walking along, I mean, it's a very well-marked trail. It's not hard to see. They're gravel. They're this wide. They're beaten down. It's just, I mean, this is the trail, guys. And so we're walking along the trail, and, and after we'd been walking for a long time, we'd getting kind of tired, we noticed looking up that where we were wanting to be was the trail up here. And, and instead of meandering further down and then making our way up there, finally, all we had to do is just kind of cut through the woods, take a little shortcut, and we could just be right there. And we would cut all this out. And so one of the cousins is like, hey, let's just go right there. We can see it. We see, we see where we want to be, and we shouldn't have to go this way longer to get there. And so just a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of uh, persuasion, and away we went. And so we went off trail, and, and, and so we're climbing up through the woods. And I'll never forget my cousin Tony when he stepped in the yellow jacket nest, okay? And those, 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 those yellow jackets go up his pants, up his shirt, and they eat him up. Sometimes the trail seems long. Sometimes it may meander. Okay? But be comfortable with God's plan. He, he, he's meandering you. He's winding you around for a reason. He's taking you on a path for a purpose. And so don't shortcut it. Don't shortcut his path. Because the results can be disastrous. And the results can be filled with hornet's nest. Follow his path. And finally, just be willing. Just be willing. What does it mean to be willing? What does it mean to give up that old mule-headed stubbornness and just start yielding to the Lord's voice? I came across this prayer that kind of says it all. And just think about these words and let them just kind of burn in. Lord, I am willing. I am willing to receive what you give. I am willing to lack what you withhold. I am willing to relinquish what you take. And I am willing to suffer what you require. And that's how we curb our tendency to resist. That's how we shed that uncomfortable mule suit and learn to run like a deer. We have all had tangled messes in our lives. For me, some of the biggest tangled messes in my life have been fences. All right? I don't know if you guys have ever had to try to roll up barbed wire. All right? But when you roll up a fence, it becomes a tangled mess. God says, just give it to me. Okay? Just let me take care of that. Or just bring, just bring that. You know, when you're teaching kids to tie knots or they have a knot, you know, what's the, the, the tendency is to become frustrated and pull the two ends. What happens when you pull the two ends and you've got a knot? It gets tighter and tighter, and we create a bigger mess. God says, just, just bring the mess to me. Michaela and Sandy was out on a golf cart a few weeks ago, and they got hung up in the mud. 
It's not hard to get a golf cart hung up in the mud. It's relatively easy. Only you need about a, is an inch, okay, uh, of rain and just a little bit of mud. And, and, and so she spins out, and, and so she wanted to take care of it. So she went and got the four-wheeler, and she brought the four-wheeler out that can handle mud, which was a good thought. And then she needed to hook up a rope. And so she began to look underneath the golf cart to think, where could I hook the rope? Ah, oh, there's a shock. So she ties the rope around the shock. Okay, yeah, there goes Coleman. Oh, <laughs> see? And so she pulled the shock off of the golf cart. And so when I came home and, and she told me, she said, this is what happened, and the golf cart's still in the mud. I said, okay, so here's the deal. I said, when something happens like this that you don't understand and you don't know how to deal with it, I said, all I want you to do is just bring me the mess. I said, because I pulled this golf cart out and brought it back to the garage in 45 seconds. I said, now the next three days will be correcting the shock problem. I said, so just bring me the mess. Okay, just bring me the mess. When you pull on the ends of the string and you don't understand how to unravel, the knot just gets tighter. And God says, just, just bring me the mess. So you just, you, you just bring me the mess and I will unravel it for you. Just bring the whole tangled knot to him. Bring him your failures. Bring him your false starts. Bring him all of your well-intentioned crusades that landed you on the backside of a lonely desert. Bring that all to him. And let him sort through the details of your life. Let God sort through the details of your life. And as he does, he will give you fresh direction. Trust me. Trust me. Nobody, nobody unties a knot like God does. Let me pray for you. Father, we are willing to receive what you give. Father, I pray that we can be willing to lack what you withhold. Father, I, I pray that I'm willing to relinquish what you take. And Lord, help us to be willing to suffer what you require. You know what we need. You know what tangled knots of our lives we need to bring to you. And you, Lord, know how we need to respond to what you've shared with us today. Father, help us to say yes. Help us to uh, be comfortable with your plan. Help us to be confident in your power. And help us to be certain of your voice. Father, you know how we need to respond in this time, in this, in this time of invitation and reflection, and you know what call you have on our, on our lives. And so, Father, I pray now that you would just guide us in this time of invitation and help us to be obedient to you. We pray it, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name.